Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, John and Pooja, again for inviting us to speak here. So my colleague, Adriana Burgia, is going to join us virtually. Um, it's it's sort of so impressive uh, to go after Kim because I feel like we're doing something that's a lot smaller in our organization um, that is just a little bit different. Um, so we're hoping at the end of this conversation, uh, you'll agree with us that the really missing part of DEI, at least in our little space, is the openness. And you've learned quite a bit uh, from the importance of having an openness and building diversity, equity, and inclusion in door to total votes at ASM. Oh, sure. I'm a little closer to me. There we go. Um, so a little bit about uh, ourselves and the American Society for Microbiology. So um, we are a member-driven organization. Uh, we largely have about 30,000 members from across the globe, but an organization based in the US. And we publish journals. We publish about 16 journals, but we also do a lot of other work from advocacy work on COVID, monkeypox, to we have an American Academy for Microbiology, we also have a global health program. So we're a very, fairly large organization and publishing is a very small part of what we do. We have 16 journals um, and we publish approximately 6,000 peer reviewed articles every single year. The journals span the breadth of microbial sciences from infectious diseases all the way to environmental and food microbiology. And we have a combination of hybrid and fully open access titles. Um, and the reason I came to ASM was really to launch this journal, Microbiology Spectrum. This is a new journal from our society. It's an open access journal. And it was always thought to be a very broad scope journal that would welcome publications from all walks of microbiology. And the reason it sort of really became very large is we wanted a very large board, a board of about 400 microbiologists. And as you'll learn from Adriana, we're actually exceeding that goal in, in some ways. And this was the main reason I actually came to ASM. And this journal is a little bit different from the other journals, the other journals at ASM, and that it accepts all articles regardless of potential impact. We really focus much more on technical soundness of the science rather than potential impact. There's no limitations in terms of scope. We welcome all microbiology into this journal. We also welcome replication studies and studies that are normally not published in other journals. So we knew fairly early on this would grow very large and we would need a very large board to manage the journal and grow the journal. So why did we really need 400 editors and why did we know the journal was going to grow so quickly as it did? Um, the real reason is it's only been launched in April, 2021. That's a little over a year from now. And we've very close to publishing 2000 articles this year, the journal's full year. So we did know it was gonna grow very quickly and we were right about that. And the main reason it's, it's a cascade journal. We have 10 other journals that authors normally submit their articles to. And if they're rejected there, they can actually transfer the paper very quickly to this journal and get it published if it's sound um, and meets other criteria for publication. So we knew it was gonna grow quickly and the cascade, cascading model meant we have to be able to handle articles that come from 10 other journals that have very distinct areas of emphasis and focus that again range from applied microbial sciences to clinical and industrial microbiology. And we already, as I said, Adriana's gonna tell you a lot more about how many editors we actually have now, but we're very close to having, if not 400, more than 400 editors. And 2022 is the journal's first full year, and we expect to publish well over 2,000 articles in a new journal. We're not a large publisher. ASM is a very small publisher. In the spectrum, we were normally publishing somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 articles every single year. And diversity of the journal starts with the leadership of the journal. Uh, we are led by an editor-in-chief, Christina Goma, based at the Broad Institute in Cambridge. She's a mycologist, mycologist for all the non-microbiologists here, study of fungi. Um, 
And we're also led by nine phenomenal senior editors who have a wide range of expertise ranging from diagnosis of infectious diseases, to virology, bacteriology, mycology, antibiotic resistance, that's a real problem today, environmental microbiology and beyond. And even this team, the leadership team is actually based in four distinct countries. And you'll hear from Adriana where our editors are actually based. So before Adriana gets started, just a little bit about what is an open editorial board and why open up an editorial board. We have a reasonably diverse leadership team. And traditionally the way ASM is built boards is the leadership team will nominate people that they know to join and become an editor of the journal. There's nothing wrong with that. I think people are very good about being, um, being cognizant of diversity, equity and inclusion when making nominations. But nonetheless, for this to work, the nominees have to be within the network of one of these individuals who are already on the leadership team. If someone is outside of the networks, they simply have no way of getting into the board at all. So we genuinely felt that there was a lot of opportunity for the board to eventually end up being a bit more closed and exclude access to individuals who might be truly interested in joining and participating in running this journal. And we have editors, we have a leadership team based in four distinct countries, but it's only four distinct countries. There's bound to be a regional bias that comes from just having them recruit editors. An open vote is exact opposite. Arina is going to go into exactly how it works, but pretty much anyone can self-nominate. Um, and so whether they are in someone's network or not has no batting on whether they end up on the board or they don't. People who know the leadership team can definitely apply. There's nothing limiting them or stopping them from applying. They can apply. But selection ultimately is based on true merit and the experience that they bring to our journal. And we think, and I'm hoping you all agree at the end of the talk, that this is a much more open and naturally inclusive process. So Ariana, if you're ready, please share our results. Great, uh, yes, can everyone hear me? Yep, we can. Awesome, great. So as Anand said, part of this uh, open board call was creating a application. So we had an open call that we advertised on ASM.org as well as the journal website. It is a simple Microsoft form that the potential nominees are directed to. And they're asked to uh, give us certain information, mainly demographic information, as well as evaluation criteria that we use specifically around their scientific expertise within the microbial sciences. Um, so the editors at Spectrum, we expect them to be uh, more or less independent in that they are able to find reviewers, make decisions on their own with minimal staff intervention. So we want people who have experience already within the peer review process. Um, so reasonable publication record that we're looking for, people who have first and corresponding author papers, also whether they have either prior experience as either a reviewer or an editor at another journal or an ASM journal, again the latter being a plus. We're also looking for people who are committed to the journal's mission. So as Anand was saying, Spectrum is a little different in that it's a sound science open access journal. So making sure the people we're bringing on board are aligned with that vision. So with all the information we collect, uh, our staff members shortlist the applications to the board based on the above criteria. And our editor in chief then reviews those recommendations. And in most cases, she moves forward. So this is something that we started um, more or less out of necessity, as Nanan said, we're looking for 400 people. We weren't sure if this would work uh, or what the result would be. And I'm happy to say we were very pleasantly surprised. We had over 2,000 applications to the board to date. Um, we can go to the next slide. That's fine. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, at the, at the moment, we have 322 total editors, which is an amazing accomplishment in itself. But that number alone is not entirely what we're proud of. What we are most proud of is the diversity behind that number. So you can see visually here on this map, we have representation on our editorial board 
from 40 total countries, which as an American-based organization, historically ASM has had a lot of regional bias in North America. Um, so just being able to have a board of this breadth um, and also having over half of our editors based outside of the US is definitely, is an accomplishment, not just for the journal, but for the ASM journals program as a whole. Furthermore, for the US-based editors, uh, we are finding that less than 50% identify as white. So we have a reasonable representation from historically underrepresented groups. We're also very close to gender parity. And another great thing that came out of this is that we have anecdotally considerable representation from early career microbiologists. So these are people who, if we had gone with a traditional board, they were complete unknowns and we would not have had them and been able to um, bring them on board and benefit from their expertise. And they have been some of our top performers. So all in all, a huge success. However, you know, as Kim has said, diversity and DEI, it's, some, it's an ongoing process. There are always things that we can be looking at and improving. So Anand, if you can go to the next slide. So as impressive as our diversity is, there are still some cracks. So um, while we do have reasonable representation and gender balance, that has been very difficult for us to maintain as we grow the board, as consistently we find that only one in four applicants identify as women. And there could be a, a number of reasons for that. As you know, there are a lot of challenges that women in science face that will make, that make them less likely to self-nominate than their male peers. Furthermore, despite the board being open and having a good uh, having about 40 countries, there's still a question of our overall reach in that more than 50% of our applicants are only from two countries, the US and China. So we struggle, while we do have representation in some parts of Asia, Latin America, and Africa, we could be doing much better. So as we continue our open board and getting more toward our goal of 400 people, our goal is to start to be a little bit more intentional about how do we focus on filling the gaps in terms of subject, not just our subject area expertise, but also how can we better find ways to get representation geographically as well as from women and people from historically underrepresented groups. So one way that we have found has helped to address this is our reviewing editors program in the next slide. So the reviewing editors, uh, this is a program that we launched back in April, and mainly it was a way to help our early career microbiologists get a pathway into becoming an editor at Spectrum. So these are candidates that we chose from the existing open board applicant pool. They had they were reasonable applicants and showed promise. However, for whatever reason, they did not have the full amount of scientific expertise that we were looking for. Um, either maybe they had a lot of a lot of um, more first author papers and corresponding author papers, or maybe overall did not have a lot of peer review experience. So we reached out to these applicants and said, "Hey, we're really interested in your application. We were impressed. Um, we might we can't bring you on as an editor at the moment, but what we can do is bring you on as a reviewing editor. And what does that mean? So a reviewing editor, their role is to commit to peer reviewing around two articles per month, up to 24 per year. And it's an overall three-year term with the potential to advance to the editor role within those three years based on their performance. So again, this was something we started. We're not exactly sure what would the response be, what would the uptake be, but once again, we were just very pleasantly surprised. Um, to date, we have about 87, and the global representation is actually even more uh, non-U.S. based than the regular editor pool. Uh, we have a total of 28 countries, and of those countries, we ha actually have countries that are represent that are not currently represented on the main editorial boards. So those include Costa Rica, Ecuador, say Kitts and Nevis, Peru, Ghana, Finland, and the Philippines. Another really great um, outcome of this reviewing editor program is we're finding that the number of women actually exceeds the number of men. So uh, there an even more diverse pool of early career applicants that were 
benefiting from giving them a pipeline into the editor role and a way to further their experience in the peer review process and um, and extend their careers. And we've, they've been very committed and we found that the top 10 performers are either women or people from historically unrepresented groups or geographic areas. And so it's just been very fulfilling to see and we hope to advance these people to the editor role within the next year. The next slide. So again, as we said, it's always an ongoing process. Um, managing a large and an international board does is very beneficial, but it also has its challenges. So collectively between the editors and the reviewing editors, we have 416 individuals from 51 countries. And again, this is our first full year in 2022, and we're hoping to publish over 2,000 articles, and which would be absolutely impossible if we did not have their support. Um, we are also working with both groups to create editor-led working groups, um, mainly a DEI working group, as well as a data policy working group. So giving them more of a voice in our journal policies and procedures as we grow and develop and mature the journal. But again, at, when you have a high volume of not just submissions and people, it does tend to be more problematic situations. That's just the law of averages really. And mainly messaging can be complicated, not just to um, our editors themselves, but also upstream editors who are the ones who are transferring articles to our journals. So just very briefly, our lessons learned have been to really focus on having a robust onboarding process for both editor groups, making sure they understand their rules, what is expected, and how to um, navigate certain situations that they will come across within the peer review process. Also ensuring accessible documentation. So while staff is always around for questions, we wanna make sure that they do have written policies and procedures that they can easily access via our portal website that we recently created for them. Also, we just need to think globally, again, especially in our messaging as something um, that uh, traditionally, again, being a US-based organization, trying to think what does this message sound to a global audience and knowing what types, what terms might be interpreted differently or what concepts do we have a different idea or see um, or see differently. And so again, that really leads to being more intentional about creating inclusive messaging for our editors and reviewing editors. And uh, finally, um, just last slide, just wanna say very special thanks to everybody at ASM who helped make Spectrum a success. Again, it's not just a non-deny, it's a huge group of people who support the development and the growth of this journal. And we are just so thankful to have the team that we have behind us and uh, we'll continue to be growing and developing the journal. And that's it. Thank you. Um, we can take some questions uh, after uh, Jennifer's presentation. We'll come back for questions for both. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so next up we have uh, my friend Jennifer Regala. Uh, Director of Publications and Executive Editor, American Neurological Association. And she is going to be presenting Not Checking a Box, Establishing DEI as a Foundation of the American Neurological Association's Flagship Journal. Jennifer. I'm just going to get your slides going for you. One Thank second. you. You can start talking now. Okay, sure. Yeah, I don't Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? So big thanks, John. Thanks, Pooja. Thank you, guys. Um, and sorry for rolling in a bit late. Traffic was a nightmare, so I got a good heart rate going this morning, and I have a nice glistening sweat so that I, I look good for my presentation. Um, really glad to be here today and um, to present on our efforts at the American Neurological Association with our flagship journal. just want to get the screen share going so that our online folks can see it. Excellent. You can keep talking. I'll just do it. 
So I'll just get started, tell you a little bit about our program um, and a little bit about myself. Um, I, I started working at the American Neurological Association um, right in the height of the pandemic and, and the lockdown um, in June of 2020. And when I started, um, my predecessor had been there for 52 years, which actually I thought I was old, but that's even older than I am. And um, we had a lot of work to do in many different regards, but the biggest thing that I saw a need for um, was advancing um, the DEI initiatives of our publications program. So our publications are, um, we have uh, three peer-reviewed journals and um, one um, newsletter that's kind of turned into, it's taken on a life of its own and turned into um, what we call a digital ecosystem. Um, we, you know, we do have, we also work on a um, CME product, multiple um, annual meeting products, and um, we also work um, internally on all outgoing AUA messaging. Um, so we, we work with um, teams internally to make sure everything looks good before it goes out the door, just to give you an idea of the scale that we're doing. Um, another thing that's interesting about our publications program is we still do all of our copy editing in-house. Um, um, we do all of our proofing ourselves, um, and we are partnered with Wolters um, Kluwer as our commercial partner. So the Journal of Urology launched in 1917, um, and again, when I started in um, 2020, um, I was all excited to dive right in. Um, editorial board engagement is one of my favorite things, and I was dismayed to learn um, the editorial board met one time a year for one hour, um, and they didn't even really speak to one another. Um, so that was um, thing number one that we had to, um, had to change. Um, and another thing, um, you know, that we, we really had to change, um, in, in addition to that engagement, um, I just will put right out there the field of urology, fewer than 10% um, of urologists are female. So that's a, that's a challenge in and of itself. Um, also, um, the American Urological Association has traditionally been very U.S. centric, um, and also um, there has not been a lot of representation um, uh, racially, ethnically, um, and, and so forth um, across the, um, the, the specialty of urology. On top of that, even, even within diversity, if you're thinking about the field of urology, um, we were also, although we do publish the broad scope of urology, um, we were very um, oncology focused um, and didn't have a lot, of, a lot of diversity, even if you consider um, subspecialties across um, uro urology. So one of the first things um, that we started talking about um, when I started this role, um, the editor in chief and I, and I will tell you that in um, 2021, we had a new editor in chief named and um, he worked closely with our um, prior editor in chief for an entire year. Um, the engagement ended up to be um, so exciting. We actually had a hard time getting our old editor to go enjoy his well-deserved break from the journal. Um, because he just hadn't realized the potential of what we could be doing and was really excited for the change. Um, we started extending, um, we took advantage of the virtual environment and started having frequent meetings with um, small groups of the editorial board, the entire editorial board. We do have over 100 members on our editorial board. And um, we started, you know, just mixing up meetings and um, priorities and talking about the concerns um, in, in regards to um, DEI initiatives. Um, we also wanted to create an environment where innovation and inclusion were not just a thing that we were talking about, but an expectation of everyone who was part of what we were doing. Um, and again, the biggest thing, the talking often within and beyond our editorial board. So um, I have to give credit to Sylvia Hunter of Adipon for helping me to make this little hot pink. I'm terrible with graphics. She helped me to create this. Um, 
and pink, if you know me as my color. Um, but our, our theme, what we're always talking about now at the Journal of Urology is that DEI is just not a box that we are willing to check. We have a lot, a lot of work to do, and um, we, we need to keep continuing to talk about this in every conversation that we're having. We've prioritized making DEI um, a number one agenda item of every meeting, whether it's one of the smaller groups of the editorial board or the full ed board at large. Um, we also understand too, though, that DEI efforts are not meant to be exclusive. So again, if you're looking at our ed board and saying, okay, well, they're talking about it, but you know, how, where is it going from there? We're trying as much as we can to involve the entire community in our discussions. Um, we're also looking at resources other organizations have provided as a roadmap. I'll talk about that um, a little bit coming up. And also I have to say um, ASM um, has been gracious in, um, in sharing their um, resources um, with me. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that in, in a slide to come. Um, and then also we've um, committed to providing transmer transparent and consistent reporting. Again, we hadn't really done any reporting in the past and um, it's, it's important for us to consider um, uh, the, the data around, um, around our efforts. And then another thing is that we will collaborate our efforts with other journals um, to start with um, in urology. Um, DEI is no place for competition. Um, so we are going to um, be um, working um, with um, our competitors, if you consider um, in a submission sense, but if you consider in a DEI sense, um, we, you know, that's something that we need to share resources instead of fighting one another for them. One thing that we've started, um, this, uh, this program launched just this year, is an early career editor program. Um, and so what this is, is an early career um, urologist is given the opportunity to serve on our editorial board. Um, and we um, selected these um, editorial um, early career editors um, from the community and from um, selection and nomination by their own peers in our um, residents um, and fellows committee and our young urologist committee. Um, they serve just a two-year term. Um, it's not renewable because we want to offer this opportunity to as many folks as possible. Um, and we want to make sure that we are um, being representative of all career levels on our editorial board. So again, with a new program, you never are quite sure how it's going to go. And it's turned out to be um, a, a fantastic um, opportunity for all. Um, these editorial, um, early career editors, excuse me, um, are invited to all editorial board meetings. They have a full seat at the table. Um, they've been instrumental in several um, topics um, of importance to editorial policy and beyond. Um, they're involved, um, they, they're, they're each matched up with one of our um, senior editors, so they do um, receive that mentorship. Um, but it turns out that they are highly contributing um, and have really changed the thinking um, of, of and the, the, the attitude and the, um, the contributions of our editorial board. Um, how do we train them so that they so that they are getting as much um, from us as we um, receive from them? Um, we do provide um, that mentorship that I mentioned, um, frequent small group meetings with our editor in chief and the senior editors and these early career editors. Um, we also um, provide a lot of um, editorial office um, staff, um, individual training, um, ins and outs of editorial manager, going through our IFA, um, and it's tailored um, on an individual level to each of these folks. Um, and again, the biggest thing is they really are true members of the team, invited to every meeting, and um, very much welcome to speak up, and they have been speaking up. Another thing that we've done since um, I, I started, um, as of November 1st, 2021, um, we had um, traditionally um, been a single anonymous peer review um, shop at the AUA. Um, but we started thinking about 
is that the best way for us to do peer review? So there was a um, brief discussion. Um, perhaps we will do double anonymous peer review. Well, urology is pretty small um, and to anonymize a paper is a challenge from a staffing level, but then also it's a really it's a real challenge too. We'd be by the time um, a paper got to our reviewers, so much would be re removed from it. It would be hard to review it at all, um, and if we missed anything, it would be pretty easy to identify where that paper was coming from. So we pivoted the conversation to open peer review, um, and again, I realize open peer review. What is the definition of that, and how are you defining that? Um, we acknowledge that this is um, an evolutionary process, of course, but um, how we're de defining open peer review for now is we do, as a, con a condition of peer review, we do publish all accepted peer review reports for all um, full-length research articles, and that includes statistical reviews and editorial reviews in addition to the um, peer reviewers' comments as well. We do offer... Um, uh, the option of anonymity to the reviewers. They can choose to um, make their name anonymous. When we first proposed this to our full editorial board, they were mostly supportive, but the, the, the cry was, well, what, what about our younger peer reviewers or our international peer reviewers? We're worried about um, them providing their names and that it will be a problem. Well. What, what we've turned out to see, and um, I'll maybe I'll um, see if John will let me come back and give a report in the future at this conference, is that um, we, um, it's the early career researchers and the global researchers who are signing their names to the peer reviews. Um, it is um, more typically um, an, an older um, researcher, someone more established in the field who is choosing not to be public with their review, which we have found to be very interesting. Um, another thing that we um, were concerned about, um, but still moved ahead anyway, was that people would decline um, on the basis of this open policy. And we've only seen um, five um, people in, in an entire year, we're almost at one year, um, decline on the basis of the open peer review. And even that those declines were um, kind of a wait and see, not, not a, um, I can't believe you're doing this and we're done with the journal forever. Also, our decline rates um, have held very steady. Um, so we haven't seen um, just, you know, a, a large um, spike in declines um, as a result of this. Um, so one year in, how's it going? It's going well anecdotally, but the next phases are to start doing some qualitative and quantitative studies on what our peer reviewers, our readers, and um, our authors and editors really think. So more on that in the future. Um, and then an encouragement of um, open discussion. Um, in, in the past, um, the, the AUA, again, um, has not um, had a, a strong history of, um, of um, diversity um, and inclusion work um, and working very hard to change that. The Journal of Urology wants to be the voice of those efforts. Um, so this, this article um, was written by a diversity and inclusion task force that has now been sunsetted um, in favor of a um, chief diversity officer um, being um, uh, chosen at the AUA and a permanent DEI committee. Um, but this blueprint and process for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, it, it was out there in the world. I, I caught wind of it, ran it by our editor-in-chief and said, what do you think? I think um, this would be a great special article for JU. He said, let me read it. And next thing you knew, it was in the journal. So the journal is trying very hard to be the mouth the mouthpiece of um, the efforts within our own um, organization. 
Um, another thing that this editorial board has done is formed the Health Equity and Diversity Table, um, the Head Table, um, as as it's called. Um, I will also say that my um, editor in chief, his wife, is an anesthesiologist, and she's very involved in DEI efforts at, at the university where they work, and she designed that um, logo for us. So I thought that was fun. Um, so the short-term goals of this group are that first. First of all, all Ed Board members are welcome, invited, and included. And if there are any um, interested parties, um, we do, you know, publicize these efforts within the urological community. All are welcome. You don't need to be on the Ed Board. Um, you don't even actually really need to be a urologist, to be honest. Um, you know, we're, we're looking all the way down to the medical school level and the high school level to see how to get um, folks involved and include it early in urology. Um, that we are in the process of um, an editorial um, that will be co-written by head table members to um, discuss these efforts um, and we'll be self-reporting data on editorial board diversity. Um, another real, um, a real challenge that we have seen is um, uh, not um, enough peer reviewers in the area of DEI and health equity. Um, so we're working to put together um, a review um, pool of those people specifically, and we'll be adding um, a checkbox to editorial manager um, for authors to identify if a paper should be um, reviewed in, in that regard. Um, and um, we are also beginning to collect um, self-reported peer reviewed data assessing um, several items. Long-term goals though, um, I mentioned the studying of open peer review data, um, the transporting and the transparency and reporting of, you know, I, I list some things here, but really we wanna be transparent in the entire process of what we're doing. What does it look like um, when your paper is submitted to the JU and how are decisions being made? Um, we want to work on training um, the, the, the head table, the editorial board, and our editorial office staff from experts in neurology and beyond. Um, we do use social media as an ongoing tool to engage discussion on DEI and, and, um, and the Journal of Urology. And we're really looking at what is a JU paper. There's been a perception for many years, a JU paper, you know, Folks have their um, stereotypes on what that means. And we're really um, looking to make um, the journal and our family of journals at large um, to be um, accessible as, um, as a, a place for um, quality um, research. I had mentioned to collaborating with um, you know, what would typically be considered our competitors, but what are one of our um, spaceship ideas, we like to have spaceship ideas um, within our editorial board, is that we're going to create a collaborative um, pool of peer reviewers across all of um, urology. Um, and even perhaps have them identified on mastheads um, across all of our publications as um, um, DEI and health equity um, experts that are shared across urology. Um, next steps, um, I, again, the conversation must, um, must keep going. And I did share um, an editorial that our editor in chief wrote here. Um, I just will say um, that he states right here, yes, I am obviously an older privileged white male who has, um, you know, he, who is here in charge of um, the, the journal. And his um, premise is very much, um, we have a long way to go and a short time to get there. Yes, this is a, a song from the um, 70s. Um, and yes, though, he really does mean it. And, and what, his, what he's really um, done is sat back and listened. Um, anytime we have a meeting, he always says, I am not leading this meeting. I am here to listen um, to the stakeholders. Um, and then educating the editorial board and editorial office. Um, so we started something called the JU um, DEI Education Series. So actually, um, Adriana, who um, I'm present, uh, presenting with today, is going to present this wonderful presentation here to our editorial board next week. 
we've already had um, another speaker from the American Society of Plant Biologists speak to the Ed Board. Um, and it was astonishing. Um, she came and talked about um, DEI efforts um, at that organization and a grant that she's working on, um, a $5 million DEI grant from the National Science Foundation across all of plant biology. And um, it was just phenomenal to see um, how many members of the Ed Board showed up um, during the middle of bu busy surgery days and really engaged with her. So Adriana, look out um, and get excited for next week. Um, and then um, these, these conversations are just very interactive. And then for those who can't make it, we keep them as a library and um, a resource. Okay, and then what does the future look like? Um, considering other perspectives. Um, so for instance, patients, um, you know, patients should be included in this conversation. So one thing we're looking at closely is starting to add patient perspectives to the front matter of the journal that would correspond to the research articles within. Um, and those would be, um, of course, self-written by patients um, if, if they chose to do so. Um, thinking a lot about wellness, um, mental health, physical health, um, you know, what does that look like and how can the Journal of Urology be part of that conversation? Also, we will be presenting to our um, board of directors in, um, in May of next year, a proposal to create a publishing institute to launch in 2024, which will um, be an educational resource um, globally. Um, and we, we have, um, I think I'm getting close to time here, but we have several plans on how to um, create this publishing institute so it's inclusive. Um, start at set the ground floor and teach us um, future leadership how to be good authors, reviewers, and editors. Um, and we're just reaching a wider off audience, not an office. I was I added this slide at the last minute, so sorry about that, John. Thanks for loving me through it. Um, and we're looking, listening, and learning um, everywhere we go and everything that we do. And then um, this is just a picture of my dog, Scotty, that I have to include in any presentation. So no one asks any questions that are too um, challenging. Just think of my dog when you're uh, thinking of your question. Thanks for your time today. Uh, for maybe one question for either Anand, uh, Adriana, or Jennifer, or, or the three. Uh, we have one here in the audience. Hi, um, thanks so much to both of you for great presentations. Um, I'm Jesse from Lexington Books, so we do scholarly publishing. And so Jennifer, I was just wondering, um, have you seen any specific benefits from switching to an open peer review model or what was kind of the, uh, the I guess the, the line, the rationale, the story, um, behind switching to that to increase diversity or uh, inclusion? Um, so what we're really seeing again, because um, we're focusing in that early space, um, that early career space, we're seeing um, a lot of um, folks learning from the story that those peer review reports tell. So, you know, you can see the progression of something sent back for um, revision um, and, and the story of that peer review process. And we're um, understanding that that is being used um, in journal clubs. And then also we have um, some um, later um, career folks who are saying, okay, first of all, it's pretty brave that these folks are signing their names to it. And I think they're learning that lesson too. And I think they're really, you know, having a, a, a bigger appreciation for um, the, the people in the community that they were the most afraid for. And those are the ones who maybe aren't afraid after all. I think I think the community is really learning a lot from it. Um, but I will acknowledge, though, that we do need to continue with the definition of open peer review looks like. And do we want to begin publishing other reports for declined paper? You know, what does that look like? Um, we're still talking about that. <sighs> So this is a question directed to Anand and Adriana from the ASM. It's coming from our online community. First, I want to commend you on the increased diversity of microbiology spectrums board of editors. I was wondering if you are tracking how that affects the diversity of authors published in the journal. 
if a direct or indirect causal relationship has been or is identified between the two, do you think you would adjust your recruiting methods for new editors and review editors to recruit more heavily from groups that are still underrepresented, either on the board of editors or as contributors published in the journal? Uh, that's a very comprehensive question. <laughs> questions go. Uh, Adrian is online as well. I know we have authors from 69 countries. We only have editors from 51 countries. So I don't know that we've not done a correlation of where the authors are from, where the editors are from. What we're working on is a lot more comprehensive mapping of is an editor from China, are they interviewing reviewers from China? So are they sort of getting others who normally don't participate in the review process to participate with us? We're just getting started on that sort of analysis where we can actually map who is the author, who is the reviewer, who is the editor, how could they possibly be connected? So at some point in the future, we'll have that level of data, but at the moment, we just don't have that level of data now. But excellent question. I can add on as well for the, uh, the second part of the question regarding our recruitment. So as I said before, we are becoming more intentional about how can we better uh, recruit some of these uh, areas where we do see that there are gaps. So part of our plan is to, again, uh, go to our uh, DEI working group within our editor pool, our existing editor pool to see what their opinions are and if they can guide us. We're also working with our ASM IDEA team uh, that's inclusive diversity with equity, action, and access. So uh, seeing where we can better uh, talk to different women in microbiology groups, particularly to see, you know, what are some barriers that we could pretend that we are not seeing that we could uh, work to uh, decrease and also for international geographic diversity. Also see if we can do some outreach specifically to institutions within those countries and get a better sense of what their challenges are and how we can best meet them and increase the recruitment in those areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? We maybe have time for one more, Early? No? Okay. Uh, thank you, Adriana and Ahmad. And thank you for